Dear distinguished guests, we would like to welcome you all to our meeting on the topic of regional cooperation possibilities and the prospect for the future in the Caucasus, organized by uh, Konrad Adenor Foundation and Center for Eurasian Studies in Ankara. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to read a telegraph sent by a PM uh, of Kayseri, Professor Dr. Pelin Gündeş Bakır, Regional cooperation possibilities and prospect for the future in the Caucasus. Uh, for your invitation, uh, thank you very much, but I'm not able to participate in due to other arrangements. And secondly, I would like to call Mr. Ambassador Ömer Engin Lutam, honorary president of AMIM, to make, her, to make his opening speech. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I welcome you all to another important meeting of AVIM in cooperation with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We are privileged today to have very distinguished keynote speaker with us. In very broad line, AVIM, the Eurasian Studies Center, has the world view that the economic and as well as the political weight and gravity in global affairs is shifting gradually from the West to Euro-Atlantic to the East Asia-Pacific. In this context and vision, Turkey is moving from being at the periphery of the European Union to which uh, she is a candidate for full membership, to the central location between the West and the East, assuming a more significant geopolitical role. As such, stability in the Caucasus is becoming more important. The title of this meeting regional cooperation possibilities and prospects for the future in the Caucasus is very much indicative of the importance of the South Caucasus region uh, of its problem. Indeed, these problems naturally result from the geopolitics of the South Caucasus since it is a region of crossroads. Historically, the region, both uh, east-west axis and north-south axis, linked the civilization, civilization of the west and the east with the Great Silk Road providing a glamorous example. In more unsettled times, the lands which are today home to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia were buffeted by the empires to their north and south with both alliances and frontiers changing with the fortunes of war and peace. The crossroad uh, and the people living around them suffer from the impact of three unresolved conflicts. These conflicts disrupt the trade, security, and stability both in the region and elsewhere. In human terms, these are the casualties of war, the dead, and injured, the refugees, and IDPs. What is the problem then? Why these conflicts still remain today? Parties to these uh, disputes will have different answers to that question and so many policymakers and mediators. We all share a positive wish to see the independent countries of South Caucasus establish themselves as peaceful, 
secure, prosperous, and democratic members of international community. We also are aware of the dangers of renewed conflict and weakened governance in this volatile region. Last but not least, the importance of the region to international trade and to the safe transportation of significant energy resources is generally recognized and accepted. What we are dealing in the Caucasus where conflicts have deep local roots. Even for that reason alone, it's difficult to resolve, let alone considering the recent tension that bears the danger of become, becoming military conflicts uh, 20 years after these disputes were labeled as frozen. 2008 war uh, remind us again of the difficulties and dangers of undermining the tension in the region. Another danger that might arise would be condescending these conflicts in a superpower zero-sum game. It is an undeniable fact that the region is now part of the outside world. Thus, what happens in the international arena uh, has regional consequences. All countries in the region are free to develop uh, relation alliances with Russian Federation or with United States, either NATO, OECE, or the uh, CSTO. Becoming a member of the Eurasian Union or pursue EU membership. Emphasize good relation with the neighbors, join international projects, or isolate themselves. The effects of the Cold War, even though it may have ended 23 years ago, are still affecting the international and therefore regional politics. But still the complexities and the character of the parties to these conflicts are very unique and must be dealt as such. Thus, generalizations risk making complicated situation even more complicated. That's why today we have experts from the region as well as from Turkey and Russia to get a better and more detailed perspective about the future of this volatile region and explore the possibilities for cooperation. Obviously, resort to use of force will be unlikely to succeed in terms of contributing to the resolution of regional conflicts and might indeed prove seriously counterproductive. Major international organizations and their members are engaged today through major programs that include macroeconomic contribution and support for changes in government policy, in key policy areas such as customs, military, police, judicial, electoral reform, as well as support the NGO and civil society development. First, despite the realist view that the region remains hostage to fragile hostilities that might erupt in the very future, we are still far away from the resolution of these conflicts where the parties refuse to have anything to do with each other. On the other hand, we must not disregard the search for peace and stability. The prospect for the progress uh, will be uh, better in the parties can have confidence that each is seeking for work exclusively through peaceful means. We have to think about the cost of failing to resolve the conflicts. The cost is not being prepared to compromise. These costs are very real. Lives continue to be lost. Lives continue to be lived out in refugee accommodation far from home. 
Military expenditures, both above and below, uh, below the official budget transparency lines, take up a large share of government spending and indeed of GMP. Investment in infrastructure either doesn't take place or is carried out in less than optimal size in a less than ideal location for reasons determined by conflict rather than economic or social policy. Society are denied the benefit of free trade because of historical and baseless enmities with no perspective for future. And meanwhile, cultural and other exchanges between the people of the region became more and more constrained. Generations are brought up with a distorted view of history and the limited choice of language and bridges became progressively more difficult to build. These conflicts and the failure to make the compromises necessary to resolve them are really costing and will continue to cost. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to organize such an event together with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. I hope this meeting will serve as a forum for exchange ideas, hopes and prospects about the future of this, excuse me, of this uh, very important region and consider this important issue in an open-minded manner. Thank you. Now, I would like to yield the floor to Dr. Colin Durkov, the head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung office in Turkey. Ambassador Lutem, Excellencies, distinguished guests and friends, a very, very good morning to all of you. <clears throat> and it gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome you all also on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And I'm very happy that we could team up with the Center for Eurasian Studies in organizing this um, important event. Um, I think the theme is very, very topical and important. And since it is the first time that we are teaming up with AVIM in uh, organizing uh, this conference, perhaps allow me just to give you a very short background about the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We are one of the six political foundations in Germany, and they are quite unique um, institutions because you wouldn't find similar foundations in other European countries. The reason for that is you can find in the recent German history, uh, political foundations have been founded in Germany for the aim of promoting democracy, both at home and later on also in other countries. The reason for that was that the Germans didn't have much experience with democracy. If you look back some 100 years, we had the German Empire, which was followed after the First World War by a chaotic uh, experiment with democracy during Weimar Republic, which led to the rise of the Nazi regime, uh, and Germans committed the worst type of uh, genocide during that time, the Holocaust. And after the Second World War, uh, one part of Germany continued with another type of um, dictatorship under the communist era, but in West Germany we were lucky enough to be given by the victorious allied powers the system of democracy. So there we were. How to run a democratic country? It's not very easy. So Konrad Adenauer, together with many other um, visionary politicians at that time, thought there must be a system of civic and political education which would uh, give knowledge to the citizens about their rights, their responsibilities, how democratic system would function, etc. 
and uh, this was funded by the government. So um, first uh, our activities started in Germany, later many other countries invited us to work together on similar programs. For example, the then Prime Minister Togut Özal in the middle of 80s uh, asked uh, his counterpart Helmut Kohl, German Chancellor, we should open an office in Turkey. That's how we came here in the middle of the 80s. That was a time where there were no really uh, NGOs, civil society organizations or think tanks. So together with ANAP at that time, we founded the Turkish Democracy Foundation with the aim of providing civic education and political education to various segments of Turkish society. Later on, many, many other um, institutions followed, one of them being the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization. And uh, we are working with them since 20 years and have already um, organized more than 45 conferences. The interesting part is that during these events, all Caucasus states' representatives are present there, also from Armenia and from Azerbaijan. Um, for your information, I have brought along some of our conference reports. They are outside, so if you're interested, please help yourselves. We also have a regional office in the Caucasus, in Tbilisi, but with also branch offices in Yerevan and Baku. And also there are a number of um, civic education programs are being uh, carried out for the youth, for women. And since uh, Ambassador Lutham has already given the broad outline uh, and set the tone for this conference, and actually I myself, I'm not really a Caucasus expert, I only know it is an area full of conflicts, even of frozen conflicts, so we are all looking forward to get enlightened by our high-powered and renowned experts. Eight of them will be uh, giving us their insights during today. And I hope at the end of the day, we will um, have quite a number of uh, findings, of conclusions, and perhaps even some recommendations how to um, <clears throat> get on from here. So thank you very much for uh, coming to our event and now we are looking forward to our first panelists. Teshe Kyrderim, thank you, danke schön. Now I would like to invite the moderator of the first panel, Aslan Yebusjir, Senior Specialist in Avim. And I would like to invite our speakers to the floor, Dr. Haykak Arshmeyan, Program Coordinator at the Regional Studies Center in Armenia, Assistant Professor Dr. Sardar Palabayık, Top University in Turkey, Dr. Nika Çtatsi, President, International Security Research Center, and uh, Dr. Associate Professor at the International Black Sea University. I'd like to welcome you to our first panel. Uh, I will briefly introduce uh, our keynote speakers. <clears throat> uh, I will be, I will have no objections to our program. You have the program. So first speaker will be Dr. Haykak Arshamyan, uh, here to my right. And he is a he is, is a civil society media youth and public sector expert with an emphasis on cross border European and diaspora dimensions. He has over seventeen years of experience working in media, education and public sector, as well as in different NGOs and international organizations. Before RIC, the work 
he worked as program manager at Yerevan Press Club and as a deputy director at Birthright Armenia Foundation. And now he is program coordinator at Regional Studies Center, Armenia. Uh, please, Dr. Ashamian, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to welcome all of you here and thank you for invitation and thank you for this uh, interesting conference meeting. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm working for the Regional Studies Center as a program coordinator for the support to the Armenia-Turkey normalization process program, which is funded by European Union under the Instrument for Stability. Uh, I would like to brief you for like two minutes only about this program uh, which uh, promotes civil society efforts towards the normalization of relations between Turkey and Armenia and towards an open uh, border by enhancing people-to-people -people contacts, expanding economic and business links, promoting cultural and educational activities, and facilitating access to balanced information in both societies. Uh, the program will last for 18 months, uh, and it has been started uh, since the January 2014. Uh, as of the Regional uh, Studies Center uh, project in this big consortium, uh, we are implementing several components. First of all, it's youth training, which aims and uh, objectives focuses on deepening of participants' knowledge, developing their skills and shaping a more positive opinion and political context of the Armenia-Turkey normalization process. Uh, we also have a media component uh, targeting to deepen the level of objective analysis among both Armenian and Turkish media professionals. Also, Speakers Bureau, uh, which aims to engage several prominent retired diplomats and officials and other high-profile figures from Armenia and Turkey to solicit a range of new policy ideas and suggestions. Uh, in addition, a regional studies center focuses on overcoming the absence of uh, the official diplomatic relations by utilizing other venues and avenues for official contacts, such and dialogue and issue-based cooperation such as NATO, uh, OSCE, and BSEC. But uh, in my speech, uh, in my presentation more, I would like uh, to more uh, concentrate on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict from the civil society prospect. Uh, because uh, I'm a member of the civil society of Armenia and involved in peacekeeping process for several years. Uh, in 2014, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict entered its 20th year of fragile and unstable ceasefire. And currently, we have a deadlock situation in the official negotiation process, increasing tension on the front line, and an increasing threat of the resumption of large-scale military operations in the light of the processes that have been started in the post-Soviet space. The situation is becoming more complicated uh, by the expansion of the Eurasian Economic Union led by Russia. Uh, the lack uh, of conflict settlement has rooted hate, war rhetoric, and negative stereotypes towards the other uh, during at least at the, at the last like 10, 15 years. And we all remember uh, recent developments in the conflict zone uh, during this summer, started in June and intensified by the end of July and August, when there was an exchange of a worse violent offense since the ceasefire agreement in 1994. And the area of military incidents in, is expanding, the arms race is increasing between the conflict sites, while the rhetoric on government and public level is becoming more radical. And further attempt to retain the current status quo challenges and threatens the regional security. Uh, the absence of progress in the conflict resolution caused huge problems for the attempts to create social economic prosperity, a strong civil society, as well as a demo democratic statehood, and uh, on the principles of rule, rule of law, fundamental freedoms, 
and human rights both in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. To be honest, uh, non-democratic political regimes both in Armenia and in Azerbaijan don't have strong and serious incentives of changing the current no war, no peace situation. From one side, the status quo helps them to keep the power in their countries, and from the other side, the political risks of changing the status quo are too high. In addition, the military resolution of the conflict also contains high risks and leads to unpredictable consequences. Both ruling regimes usually are manipulating with Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to justify the fails and loses in their internal policies. Um, so what sh should be done? What kind of recommendations can be delivered uh, to the governments of Armenia and Azerbaijan, to the regional powers, and to the international community? First of all, uh, conflict sites should retrain, uh, refrain sorry, from warlike rhetoric and political and information action aimed at conflict escalation. Uh, secondly, uh, the conflict sites and the international uh, community should take urgent measures on securing the ceasefire and preventing armed clashes and to ensure the immediate withdrawal of snipers from the front line. Also, uh, there is a need to add to basic rules of the conflict resolution, such as the non-use of force, territorial integrity, equal rights, and self-determination of people, the principle of peaceful resolution of disputes, based on the Helsinki Final Act. Also, there is a, a need to begin to start already the de development of a roadmap uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict resolution. The negotiation process of conflict resolution should be open and transparent for societies. Thus, for example, an international forum or assembly with representatives of governments of civil society of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict sites, together with the representatives of international organizations, can be prepared, uh, prepared to support the peace process and its practical implementation. Use, using international peacekeeping forces also is an option but only in case when neither the country's co-chairs of Minsk Group nor the neighboring countries of the conflict sites would be included. This will enable to have an international mediation from, free from any geopolitical interests. Also, the big powers need to stop the supply of all kinds of offensive weapons in the region of the conflict. Uh, it is necessary that all conflict sites should understand and be ready for mutual compromise with reject of maximalist demands and preconditions. From, the, uh, from their side, the international community and the big powers who are involved in negotiation process of Nagorno-Karabakh need to prove that they are sincere in their efforts by international, uh, by, uh, for peacefully res uh, resolving the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And uh, it is necessary that both countries and the international community need to intensify the track to activities that can support the transformation of attitudes mainly focused on education and training programs for youth to prevent the mainstream hate speech and the propaganda. Also, in that track to activities, it's necessary to include cross-border confidence building measures sustaining ceasefire agreement and defending the peace process. Another option for track 2 could be joint involvement in the project addresses the issues of mutual concern such as economic, energy and environmental security issues. And finally, the civil societies on all sides of the conflict, all political and public forces should become active participants in the peace process and must take their share of responsibility in the peaceful settlement of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashamyan, uh, for this valuable and very timely presentation. Actually, we will have like one and a half hours for the other two presentations, so uh, you are welcome to you know, expand your presentations, if you will. 
But uh, I think we will have a lot of time for Q&A session, and I will be, as, uh, as the moderator, I uh, reserve my right to speak at the end, if you, if you must. Uh, and, uh, and the next speaker is Dr. Mustafa Sardar Palabik from Tob University. Uh, just, just briefly, I will introduce him to you. Uh, Dr. Palabik's areas of expertise are history of Ottoman diplomacy, Turkish foreign politics, theories of geopolitics and international relations. He is the author of numerous publications, such as Sadabat Pact, uh, and analyzes based on alliance theories, and the establishment and activities of the Eastern Legion in French archival documents, which was published in Avim's uh, peer-reviewed journal, Review of Armenian Studies, in 2008. Um, he is now assistant professor and department uh, uh, of international relations at Tob University of uh, Economics and Technology. Floor is yours, Dr. Palavik. Thank you. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the hosts of this uh, organization for inviting me to make my speech here on Turkish-Armenian relations in the 2000s. In the next 20 minutes, hopefully, I'll briefly um, uh, talk about uh, the changing significance of Caucasus in 2000s, the uh, impact of these changes on Turkey and Armenia, the uh, policies of rapprochement between Turkey and Armenia, uh, the benefits and limitations of this uh, rapprochement process, and finally, uh, some kind of optimistic, constructive prospect for the future of uh, Turkish-Armenian relations. Um, well, uh, in the 1990s, uh, it was a very troublesome era for both Turkey and Armenia and for the regional states as well. The end of Cold War, the uncertainties it had brought, uh, regional conflicts uh, made 1990s a problematic era for the region. However, in 2000s, uh, there are some dramatic changes making Caucasus a very significant area uh, in the world. Some of these uh, significant developments are as follows, as you can see in the slide. First of all, we have the 9-11 events, which uh, brings the United States close to the region through its intervention in Afghanistan and through also uh, energy projects. Uh, the United States is a very significant actor in the pipeline projects as well. Secondly, we have the return of Russia to the region under Putin administration, particularly the uh, solution of Chechnyan problem by military force, Russian intervention in Georgia, and uh, again, Russian interest in pipeline projects made Russia a very significant actor in the region. And also, we see that the Caspian Basin uh, turned out to be a very significant energy hub, uh, which is not only important for regional actors, but also important for the Western markets as well. Therefore, in 2000s, uh, the region, Caucasia, turned out to be a region of international rivalry. Um, when we look at the implications of these changes on Turkey, we can say that in the 1990s, uh, Turkey tried to focus more on Central Asia instead of Caucasia. Uh, Turkey tried to present itself as a model country in the uh, 1990s to the newly independent Central Asian republics. But in 2000s, disappointed uh, for not welcoming, let me say, in the region, uh, Turkey turned its uh, attention to the Caucasus region. Also, there are many important changes uh, in Turkish foreign policy. One is the zero problem with neighbors policy, particularly uh, the policy of the uh, AKP governments. Uh, this makes the uh, neighbors very significant for Turkish foreign policy, particularly the neighbors with which Turkey have significant problems. Secondly, Turkey became an active actor in the uh, energy transportation projects, uh, the pipeline projects. Therefore, Turkey focused its attention uh, on the Caucasus region. And finally, Turkey was very much concerned with increasing Russian 
uh, presence in the region, particularly after 2008, a uh, Russian factor turned out to be a significant factor in Turkish policy once again. Uh, coming to Armenia, uh, again, these changes in international environment has, uh, have dramatic implications on Armenia as well. Uh, to start with, uh, having problematic relations with Turkey and Azerbaijan, uh, her two neighbors, Armenia had to rely on Russia more and more, both in terms of provision of uh, national security as well as uh, in economic terms. One of the largest Russian military bases outside Russia was in Armenia, as you know, and in 2010, uh, the use of this military base was extended until 2044. Uh, moreover, the share of Russia in Armenian economy was uh, significant. 20% of Armenian trade was made with uh, Russia, followed only by Germany uh, by 10%. Uh, secondly, Armenia uh, was a landlocked state, uh, having closed borders with Turkey and Azerbaijan, as well as an insecure border with Georgia, particularly after 2008, uh, and this had a negative implications on Armenian economy as well. Uh, third, there were significant domestic problems uh, in Armenia, uh, exacerbated particularly by the global economic crisis. There emerged some social tensions, economic problems in this country, uh, particularly in last October, uh, thousands of Armenians uh, protested against the governments. And finally, last but not least, there was this famous Karabakh problem, which is frozen but still unresolved, and it was a very significant impediment in front of normalization of uh, Turkish-Armenian relations as well, uh, and also, of course, Armenian-Azerbaijan relations. Uh, having said this, uh, let me recall once again the traditional problems, let me say, between Turkey and Armenia descending from uh, 1990s. Uh, the basic problem is, of course, the lack of diplomatic relations, uh, bilateral diplomatic relations. Although Turkey uh, was one of the first uh, countries recognizing the independence of Armenia, uh, the wording uh, of Western Armenia in the Armenian Declaration of Independence was read by Turkey as non-recognition of Turkish territorial integrity. That's why Turkey did not establish uh, bilateral diplomatic relations. Indeed, uh, when Armenia became a member of the uh, Conference on Security and Cooperation of Europe in 1992, uh, as a membership criteria, uh, Armenia recognized the unviolability of uh, borders as a membership criteria, but Turkey continued to uh, demand a clear recognition of uh, the Treaty of Kars of 1921, establishing the border between Turkey and Armenia. The second problem is the closed borders, of course. Uh, uh, indeed, it, Turkish uh, Armenian border was closed in 1993 after uh, the occupation of Kalbejar Rayon of uh, Azerbaijan, and it's still closed. Uh, in several occasions, Turkish policymakers declared that the border would remain closed uh, until uh, the occupation ends. Finally, uh, and maybe the most difficult problem to resolve was the controversy over 1915. We all know the story. Uh, Turkish side did not recognize it as a genocide, while the Armenian side both recognized it as a genocide and uh, attempted the international community to recognize it as a genocide as well. Therefore, this controversy uh, is a very significant problem uh, in terms of bilateral relations. Uh, having recalled these problems, indeed, uh, it can be argued that 2000s uh, have been more promising compared to 1990s. There were significant cornerstones, significant landmark events for normalization of relations between Turkey and Armenia. Uh, I'll just briefly mention about a few of them, uh, just to uh, show how uh, the dialogue between Turkey and Armenia, although most of the time it failed, uh, turned out to be a platform for normalization. Uh, the period started with the uh, establishment of Turkish-Armenian Reconciliation Commission in 2001 to promote mutual understanding and goodwill between the Turks and Armenians and the 
uh, encourage improved relations, improved bilateral relations. The initial meetings were promising uh, indeed. However, uh, when the International Center of Transitional Justice uh, was called to investigate the applicability of 1948 Genocide Convention on 1915 relocation, uh, the commission was dismissed because the Turkish uh, the, uh, side uh, did not want this. Uh, this failed experience uh, was followed by ministerial meetings uh, by, the, by the foreign ministers of two states, particularly in 2002-2003, the foreign ministers come together in various international platforms not to discuss uh, 1915 events, but to discuss mainly the Karabakh question, how to resolve it. Although uh, there was uh, not a tangible result uh, at the end of these discussions, uh, a significant, uh, maybe symbolic, but significant development occurred, and for the first time, uh, the Armenian chief of staff was invited uh, to a NATO exercise in Istanbul, uh, and this was a symbolic but important step. The third cornerstone was the establishment of Vienna Turkish Armenian platform in 2004, established by uh, two Austrian uh, academicians, one Turkish and one Armenian academician. The aim was to exchange archival documents with regard to 1915 events uh, to decide what had happened uh, at that period. Uh, and uh, in this occasion, uh, first 100 documents were exchanged and then 80 documents was asked from the Turkish and Armenian side. The Turkish side delivered the documents, but the Armenian side refrained to do so and the project once again failed. You can see the uh, products of these two projects, Turkish-Armenian Reconciliation Commission, as well as the Vienna-Turkish-Armenian uh, platform as uh, published as books. Uh, so they are very uh, important. And then, uh, after these initial failures, uh, Turkish side began to change uh, its approach to the issue and became an initiative-taking actor rather than a reactive actor. Uh, the first clear indication of this policy was the declaration of Turkish Grand National Assembly in 2005 for the establishment of a joint historians commission to discuss 1915 events. This commission would be formed by Turkish, Armenian and third party uh, historians and all related archives should be opened for their use. This offer was sent as a letter to President Kocharyan of uh, Armenia. The reply of President Kocharyan uh, was a counteroffer, indeed, uh, of establishing an uh, intergovernmental uh, commission rather than a joint historians commission, which would discuss not only 1915 events, but also all kinds of uh, problems between Turkey and Armenia, while the Turkish side uh, read this uh, counter offer as uh, the dilution uh, of the process. Meanwhile, a symbolic development occurred with the restoration of the Church of Holy Cross in Akdamar in Lake One, which is one of the uh, most sacred places for the Armenians. Uh, and from, 10, 000, uh, from, uh, from 2010 onwards, uh, annual liturgies were organized in uh, this church, uh, which is participated not only by Turkish Armenians, but also Armenians from all over the world. Uh, and then comes the famous football diplomacy. We all know the story. Uh, President Sarkisyan of Armenia invited President Gül of Turkey to watch a Turkish-Armenian football uh, match in Yerevan. Uh, President Gül accepted the offer, went Yerevan, and uh, this was a very significant public affair. This visit was reciprocated by President Sarkisyan as well uh, for the return match uh, which was played in Bursa, Turkey. And these top-level uh, meetings uh, were very fruitful indeed for the preparation of the famous protocols of 2009. The protocols were very important. They were prepared with the mediation of Switzerland, European Union, and the United States. Indeed, there are two major protocols. Uh, the first for the establishment of uh, bilateral diplomatic relations, uh, and the second for developing good relations uh, between two states. 
Uh, in the first protocol, there are two significant uh, uh, articles which Turkey was very much focused on. The first article argues for uh, confirming the mutual recognition of the existing border between the two countries as defined by the relevant treaties of international law. Uh, this article was read by Turkey as the clear recognition of the Treaty of Kars. And the second article says, uh, uh, reiterating the party's commitment to refrain from pursuing any policy incompatible with the spirit of good neighborly relations. Turkey reads this article as the abandonment of uh, Armenian attempts as a state policy for the international recognition of uh, 1915 events as genocide, uh, although the Armenian side, of course, uh, does not read it like that. Um, after the signature, as a procedure, the protocols uh, were sent to the Armenian Constitutional Court for ratification, and the Constitutional Court decides that the protocols should not contradict the Armenian Declaration of Independence, uh, meaning that uh, the Armenian attempts for uh, uh, international recognition uh, of uh, 1915 events as genocide uh, would continue to be a state policy. Uh, the Turkish side uh, sees this uh, decision as again the dilution of the process and became very reluctant for ratification and this reluctance was read by the Armenian side as the, uh, as the end of this process because Turkey did not want to ratify it. Therefore, in uh, 2010, the ratification process was declared suspended. Uh, after this failure, uh, there is the, 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 uh, no concrete step uh, for normalization of relations except for the uh, recent uh, 2014 message of uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, at that time he was Prime Minister, uh, the message of condolence to uh, those Armenians who lost their lives in 1915 events. Uh, this message was made for the first time, such a message of condolence, and it uh, was very important, very symbolic, uh, for uh, showing the change of, not position maybe, but approach uh, in the Turkish side. Then what has changed? What was the discursive transformation that led to these uh, changes? Indeed, uh, the <coughs> Uh, the reason for such a transformation in Turkish foreign policy uh, seeking a rapprochement with Armenia was a new discourses developed for re-evaluating the Turkish foreign policy in general and uh, the 1915 relocation in particular. Uh, as I said, this re-evaluation uh, re does not necessarily mean a position change but a change in approach. To start with the proactive diplomacy of uh, Davutoğlu, particularly the foreign minister at that time, uh, which aimed to make Turkey an active and an initiative taker actor rather than a reactive actor to the international developments. Thus, instead of simply reacting what had happened outside Turkey, uh, Davutoğlu tends to surprise, in a sense, international political opinion by opening up new discursive lines. Two of them were developed for uh, re-evaluating 1915 events. One is the concept of just memory. Uh, it focuses on a fair treatment of what had happened in 1915 by both acknowledging the great suffering of the Armenians and at the same time recognizing the reasons, motives for relocation in a historical context. This leads us to the second discourse, namely the common grief approach, uh, meaning that uh, in the process of the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, uh, all communities of the empire suffered tremendously. Isolating one grief uh, from the others, uh, in, uh, instead of isolating one grief from the others, commemorating this common grief would increase common understanding among the inheritors of the Ottoman Empire the discourse says. Uh, having discussed these landmark events and this discursive transformation, now I want to focus a bit uh, on the mutual benefits of rapprochement. Indeed, uh, the benefits of rapprochement can be political and economic. The economic benefits of rapprochement uh, can be summarized as uh, increasing 
economic performance, particularly in the border region after the opening of the borders, uh, the uh, Turkish provinces in the border region might benefit from border opening. But of course the uh, economic benefits of border opening for Armenia is more significant. Uh, Armenian economy can boost with the uh, opening of the borders, particularly some uh, studies uh, expect that after the opening of the borders, Armenian trade would double. Uh, this would be very beneficial for uh, the Armenian ec uh, economic performance. Also, the decreasing costs uh, for transportation in general and energy transportation in particular uh, is very important because, as you know, uh, the Baku Tbilisi uh, Jehan uh, oil pipeline is a bit longer uh, because it uh, did not include Armenia. If Armenia can be included in such schemes, uh, the uh, cost of uh, energy transportation might decrease. This would be another economic uh, benefit. And of course, uh, the Armenian dependence on Russia might decrease because uh, the secure and stable environment as well as the economic, uh, increasing economic performance of Armenia might result in a decrease in uh, Russian influence, Russian uh, presence in Armenia. And of course, the most significant benefit might be a more stable Caucasus, which is very significant not only for regional actors but also for global actors as well. Uh, these were the positive side of the story, these were the uh, advantages. But there are some limits of rapprochement as well. There are skeptics in the both sides, both in Armenia and Turkey, particularly with regard to the economic benefits. Uh, the Armenian skeptics argue that uh, the opening of the borders would be extremely detrimental for the Armenian economy because Armenian exports were very low indeed, uh, and Turkey has already produced what has been produced in Armenia, so uh, Turkey would not import much from Armenia, but Armenia uh, will import uh, in high amounts from Turkey. The skeptics from Armenia argue that this would make Armenia a dependent country on Turkey, which is an undesired result of the opening of the borders. The Turkish skeptics, on the other hand, argue that uh, relative gains from Armenia would not compensate the losses emerge out of prospective setbacks in Turkish-Azeri relations. And this brings us to the Karabakh question. In other words, uh, for a complete rapprochement between Turkey and Armenia, uh, the Karabakh conflict had to be resolved, or at least uh, significant steps, sound steps, should be taken for the resolution of this problem. Because it can be anticipated that uh, Turkey could and would uh, not risk its good relations and energy cooperation, energy partnership with Azerbaijan. Therefore, the resolution of Armenian-Azeri conflict would have extremely positive implications on Turkish-Armenian relations as well. Another significant uh, limitation might be 2015, uh, the 100th anniversary of uh, the Armenian genocide, as the Armenians uh, called it. Uh, and uh, this would uh, decrease the enthusiasm in Turkey uh, to uh, develop uh, friendly relations, to uh, pursue for good relations with uh, Armenia. Uh, it would have negative implications. Finally, the real problem, I think, is the lack of confidence between two societies. This must be established if uh, total rapprochement, uh, total reconciliation is uh, needed. And finally, uh, I'll briefly talk about what can be done. Indeed, uh, this is a complementary of uh, what uh, the former speaker uh, has uh, mentioned. Uh, I think the protocols was a good starting point. Uh, at least we have the protocols in our hands. The protocols can be modified in accordance with the interests of uh, the parties, and also it can be extended in a way to include Azerbaijan and the Karabakh question as well. So instead of a two-party resolution, maybe a three-party resolution uh, is, can be more beneficial with regard to that issue. Uh, secondly, international uh, platforms 
for the resolution of the Karabakh problem, the most important of which was the Minsk group, should be reactivated uh, effectively in a way to bring a sound solution to the Karabakh problem. Building inter-societal confidence is extremely important and increasing civil society contacts for confidence building is very, very, very important. Student exchanges, uh, mutual visits of journalists, media people, other social groups uh, might be a good starting point. Again, adopting a functionalist point of view, increasing technical cooperation among Caucasian countries uh, might ease confidence building, common technical projects, scientific cooperation, educational cooperation, and a very important theme, cooperation for elimination of negative wordings in school books uh, can be uh, a very fruitful way uh, for increasing confidence among societies. Uh, all in all, uh, to recapitulate, uh, I think Turkish-Armenian uh, normalization of relations should be transformed into a regional project by including first and foremost Azerbaijan and other regional actors as well. Grand rapprochement schemes uh, might be uh, disappointing in short term. More incremental steps should be taken. The problems are not political, but also uh, historical and emotional. Therefore, confidence building is very important, and this confidence building cannot emerge haphazardly. Rather, uh, it, should be, uh, it, it can be done gradually. What is important, I think, is the goodwill. Uh, if each, each regional actor aims to a constructive approach, a good starting point can be achieved. This starting point, as I mentioned, should not expect enormous developments in the short run and rapid resolution of all regional problems. However, increasing contacts might contribute to the establishment of this common ground. At the end, uh, a stable Caucasia would create great opportunities, not only for regional actors, but also for all global actors. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Palavik. Uh, and our last speaker is Dr. Nika Shitatse. Uh, he is a specialist in Caucasus geopolitics, external relations, and strategic affairs. He is also the president of the George Marshall Alumni Union, George International Security Research Center at Tbilisi. He previously served as senior advisor on the National Security Council of Georgia and was head of the public relations division of the state Agency for Regulation of Oil and Gas Resources of Georgia. He is currently, uh, he is also a PhD uh, associate professor uh, of, uh, at the International Black Sea University. Uh, floor is yours, Dr. Stadze. Thank you. Thank you, Aslan. Uh, <clears throat> dear guests, dear chairman, uh, first of all, uh, I would like, of course, uh, to express my gratitude to the uh, organizers um, of the um, uh, conference. Uh, uh, thank you to the Center for Eurasian uh, Studies and uh, Konrad Adenauer Foundations um, uh, for um, organizing uh, such important uh, uh, events and uh, giving me and uh, my uh, colleagues an opportunity uh, to a uh, presentation before the uh, distinguished uh, audience. Uh, with your permission, I will uh, discuss about the general situation in uh, um, uh, Caucasus and the uh, future perspectives of uh, uh, cooperation. First of all, of course, it's necessary uh, to <coughs> point out about the importance of the uh, geopolitical location of the South uh, Caucasus region, region which is located between uh, uh, the Christian and Islamic world, between uh, Western, East, uh, North and South, and of course uh, uh, the, the geopolitical, geoeconomic and uh, geostrategic uh, location uh, as uh, given uh, to the um, South Caucasus uh, uh, region, uh, together with the uh, region of the White Black Sea area, is uh, a great, uh, uh, great importance. Of course, uh, we should mention here about uh, the positive events which were held uh, in the South Caucasus region after uh, the um, uh, ending of the Cold War and collapse of USSR. Uh, first of all, uh, they are interrelated with the gaining of independence uh, uh, by 
uh, Georgia, Armenia, and uh, uh, Azerbaijan. Of course, all uh, introduction of the new regional initiatives, including uh, Black Sea Economic uh, Cooperation, including the joining <coughs> by three uh, countries from South uh, Caucasus, uh, NATO program uh, partnership uh, for uh, peace. Of course, transport corridor uh, projects, Trasika uh, uh, project, uh, um, uh, joining uh, by <coughs> three uh, Caucasus uh, countries, uh, EU neighborhood initiative in 2004, and uh, uh, later uh, joining uh, the uh, Eastern Partnership Program of the, um, uh, of the European Union. But at the same time, it's necessary, of course, to mention here about such uh, negative uh, factors which are interrelated <coughs> with the conflicts, with uh, uh, closing the borders uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, between Turkey and um, uh, Armenia, tensions uh, between uh, Russian Federation and <coughs> Uh, uh, Georgia, um, 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 uh, um, uh, also <coughs> occupied territories uh, by uh, Russia on the territory of uh, Georgia, uh, um, a convenient uh, base uh, for the terrorist activities because we know that the uh, region is um, uh, located nearby from, the, from one side, from the North Caucasus region, and uh, from the other uh, side, uh, near to the territory of the Middle East and the uh, uh, territory which is um, uh, under uh, control of of a so-called um, um, Islamic, uh, Islamic State on the territory of Iraq and um, um, Syria. But at the same time, taking into uh, consideration the important geopolitical location of the South Caucasus, of course, um, uh, different um, main geopolitical players uh, have um, a different uh, approach and different uh, interests uh, in the South uh, Caucasus region. First of all, should be mentioned about the United States of America with regard to U.S. Uh, taking into consideration uh, the fact, um, uh, first, related to the energy uh, factors, that the uh, U.S. satisfies its need for 50 percent on the oil which is imported uh, from the outside of the United States of America. Of course, uh, USA is interesting uh, in in the exploration and <coughs> uh, transportation of the alternative uh, sources of oil. And in this regard, of course, Caspian uh, Sea region from one side and Caucasus uh, region as a uh, transit uh, territory represents the zone of the strategic uh, interest uh, for the United States of America. USA, of course, is uh, interested uh, very much uh, in uh, the <coughs> successful implementation of the oil and uh, gas uh, project um, uh, with participation of the um, uh, ally of USA, I mean European, uh, European Union, and uh, um, uh, providing the energy security of the um, uh, European countries, allies of the United States of America, via territory of Azerbaijan, Georgia, etc., etc. Uh, furthermore, of course, taking into consideration the South Caucasus is uh, uh, bordering with um, uh, two main uh, geopolitical rivals of the United States of uh, America. From one side, it's um, Iran, and uh, from the other side, <coughs> Uh, Russian Federation and uh, events in Ukraine uh, clearly shown by this way, uh, yes, uh, that uh, um, finally may be shown that uh, uh, even after the cold, after the ending of the Cold War uh, period, uh, um, uh, Atlantis USA and Eurasian East Russia, they are uh, still the geopolitical um, uh, rivals and of course uh, due to it, uh, USA, uh, which was always interested uh, in the strengthening its uh, position in the Caucasus and uh, before in the Black Sea region because we know uh, that after the uh, Cold War uh, period, the first doctrine which was adopted by the United States of America, it was Truman's doctrine in 1947, main purpose of which uh, it was um, um, uh, protection of the uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Turkey and uh, Greece, especially Turkey, which was bordering with uh, USSR. Of course, uh, we uh, should uh, mention here that the uh, South Caucasus uh, uh, region and wide Black Sea area represents um, one of the main interests uh, for, uh, within the foreign policy priorities of uh, the United States uh, of America. With regard to European Union, of course, uh, interests of EU coincide with the uh, interests of the uh, United States of America. First of all, also should be taken into consideration here the energy factors, because if we take into consideration uh, that uh, uh, annual uh, consumption of natural gas uh, uh, of EU, it's about 600 billion, a cubic meters of natural gas and at the 
same uh, time, um, uh, EU member countries uh, import, not different countries, they import uh, uh, from uh, Russia uh, annually from 130 till 150 billion cubic meters of natural gas, taking into uh, consideration the crisis in uh, Ukraine, and I do not mean only uh, war today between Russia and Ukraine, but I mean crisis uh, in 2006 and in 2009, and taking into consideration uh, the uh, geopolitical rivalry between EU and uh, uh, Russia. Of course, the uh, uh, European Union is interested in the decreasing its energy dependence on the Russian uh, Federation and, by this way, the finding of the alternative uh, uh, ways for the import of uh, natural gas. And by this way, of course, um, before Nabucco and today, for example, Tanakh or Agri um, uh, um, um, uh, gas uh, projects uh, represents uh, the strategic importance uh, for the European European uh, Union. Furthermore, uh, we know that the uh, EU is actively uh, works uh, uh, for the working out, uh, for the producing the alternative sources of energy. According to the EU energy strategy in the 2010, uh, on the share of the alternative uh, sources of energy should come about 20% uh, uh, of the energy consumption of the uh, European uh, Union. Um, with regard to uh, Russian Federation, Russia, of course, uh, which um, considers um, uh, post-Soviet um, uh, space as a, a zone of the geopolitical interests uh, of uh, Russia, and uh, we know that uh, according to the foreign poli uh, policy concept of uh, um, Russia, uh, the world uh, should be, let's say here, multipolar, where uh, Russia will, as a nuclear power, will have uh, its uh, um, role as a regional power on, uh, um, uh, for the controlling of uh, one sixth um, 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 part of, um, um, of our Earth, I mean here, uh, post-Soviet uh, space. And due to it, of course, uh, uh, Russia, which managed to occupy territory of uh, South Caucasus um, uh, in the beginning of uh, 19th uh, century, always consider uh, this uh, territory, territory which you know, before was bordering with Ottoman Empire, etc., etc., as a zone of the strategic interest of Russia. Due to it, of course, uh, we know that after the Cold War uh, period, uh, <coughs> as Russia paid special attention uh, to the <coughs> South, uh, South Caucasus uh, region, <coughs> and we know that one, um, uh, there were several reasons of the war in August of 2008. Among of them, um, one of them it was, of course, to control uh, those uh, pipelines which were um, uh, crossing the territory of uh, Georgia because Russia is interested, uh, of course, in the uh, um, in the, uh, in the, was interested in the establishment control over the um, pipelines and by this way the decreasing the role of Georgia as a transit state and keep its uh, monopolistic position for the um, energy export on the uh, western, uh, western market. From the other side, Russia is still interested, of course, in the uh, weakening of the statehood of uh, Georgia and by this way Russia, of course, uh, um, still supports um, uh, Abkhazia and uh, so-called uh, South, um, South uh, Ossetia by uh, the signing of so-called uh, treaties uh, between Abkhazia and Russia about cooperation, integration, etc., etc., etc. Furthermore, of course, uh, by this way, movement of the occupation lines uh, within the territory of um, uh, Georgia also by this way, uh, and also uh, uh, attempt of Russia to play the role of, uh, um, let's say, a mediator in the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflicts and organization of meetings of the president of Armenia and Azerbaijan, but from the other side is uh, having the interest of the keeping the status quo by this way, also, of course, uh, it's interest of Russia by this way to have under its um, uh, influence um, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, both countries. With regard to Armenia, we know here about, um, it was mentioned by my Turkish colleagues about one of the biggest uh, military base um, uh, in Gyumri uh, by Russian Federation, outside of uh, Russian uh, Federation, and uh, also pressure on Armenia uh, for the refusal of the joining uh, uh, EU Eastern Partnership Program from one side, and from the other side, joining of the Eurasian. <coughs> Uh, custom um, uh, union, and uh, also we should mention here about Azerbaijan that Russia is interested in the uh, purchasing uh, the additional volume of oil at national gas, increasing uh, the capacity of the Baku-Novorossiysk pipeline, and by this way, uh, 
uh, to extract the additional resources of uh, energy and um, by this way to hamper the implementation of uh, uh, the uh, projects with participation of uh, uh, Georgia, Turkey and several European uh, states. With regard to Turkey, since um, uh, the um, uh, pe uh, period of the disintegration of USSR, of course, uh, Turkey uh, tried to play the, uh, one of the leading role in um, Caucasus region and White Black Sea area. And one of the um, uh, main examples, it was, of course, that Turkey was initiator of the foundation's uh, regional initiative, Black Sea Economic uh, uh, Cooperation Organization. Uh, Turkey was uh, lobbying um, uh, at the same time, of course, the uh, construction of the uh, bakut pilisi Jehan pipeline from the territory of uh, uh, Georgia, bakut pilisi Erzurum uh, pipeline also from the territory of, uh, um, uh, of um, uh, Georgia. Uh, from the other side, it's necessary to mention, of course, about the relations between uh, Turkey and uh, Russia. From the other side, that volume of trade between two states uh, uh, prevailed 35 billion US dollars, and for, for about 65 percent, Turkey is dependent on the Russian um, the natural gas uh, due to the Blue Stream uh, project. But uh, in my uh, point of uh, view, um, uh, taking into consideration the um, coincidences of the interests of Turkey and United States of America during the last time related to the Syria crisis, um, related to uh, the uh, um, problem in Crimea, by this way, when uh, about 15 percent of the population of Crimea, they are Crimean uh, Tatars, uh, and when coincidence of the interests of the West and Turkey, taking into uh, consideration um, at the same time the implementation of the additional energy project, we know here about the Shah Deniz II project or uh, TANAP project, uh, despite the uh, offering by the uh, Hamlet Putin as a new project, Blue Stream 2, uh, the two uh, capacity of which is about 63 uh, billion cubic meters of natural gas. In my point of view, anyway, I think that uh, uh, Turkey will uh, prepare by this way to continue and uh, promote cooperation with uh, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan and also um, um, promote cooperation and um, um, uh, establish new relations with Armenia related to the uh, possibility of the opening border, about which it was mentioned by my uh, Turkish um, uh, Turkish. Uh, Colleagues. So, with regard to Iran, of course, Iran also has its uh, interest in uh, South Caucasus region because of the uh, putting investments in the different sectors of economy of the South Caucasus states. Iran, uh, as you know, was trying, uh, um, by this way, um, uh, um, uh, to be involved in the Caspian oil projects, but uh, it uh, was refused by the uh, American companies to, to be involved there. But anyway, of course, for example, Iran is interested in the uh, exporting of its products uh, uh, via the Black Sea um, uh, uh, ports using uh, Batumi and um, uh, Batumi and uh, uh, Poti, uh, Poti ports and uh, um, uh, at the same time, okay, to be more active in the South Caucasus region. Furthermore, in my point of view, it's possible somehow to resolve the problem of the Iranian nuclear program um, by the offering to Iran um, uh, to be more transparent related to the implementation of the nuclear program, but instead of it to offer to Iran to be involved in the energy projects. For example, it would be possible to construct the additional pipeline or increase the pipeline which connects the energy systems of Iran and uh, Turkey uh, with uh, the perspectives of the uh, father mm, expert of um, uh, Iranian oil and gas on the European market uh, by a territory of uh, South Caucasus or territory of, um, uh, of uh, Turkey. And uh, in this regard, of course, it's uh, important um, to mention here about uh, those regional initiatives which uh, should uh, promote uh, the uh, cooperation uh, in the region. Uh, first of all, necessary to mention among all the regional initiatives um, about several transport um, uh, projects among all them we should mention about Bakut Pilisi Karls, Ahalkalaki Karls railway project, uh, in, uh, and uh, in uh, capacity of uh, this uh, railway will be uh, about 20 million tons of the different type of uh, kind of goods uh, uh, per year. It, it will be possible by this way, first of all, to connect with each other railway systems of Georgia and uh, Turkey, and of course it will increase. Um, volume of trade between two states. We know that on the share of Turkey, uh, as to the year of 2013, uh, it uh, was coming about 14, 15 
50% of the foreign trade of um, Georgia. And furthermore, it will be possible in this case uh, the connection of the railway systems of uh, Europe with Central Asia. And uh, it uh, would be one of the, uh, let's say here, um, um, example of the successful implementation of the um, uh, um, uh, project within the Trasica uh, initiative, uh, Eurasia Transport um, Corridor Initiative. Uh, among all the other, we know here about the existing uh, pipelines um, uh, between uh, uh, existed pipelines with participation of uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and uh, uh, Turkey. I mean, Bakut uh, Pulisi Jehan oil pipeline, capacity of which is about uh, 50 million uh, um, tons of oil. Bakut uh, Pulisi Erzurum gas pipeline, capacity of which is 8.8 .8 billion cubic meters of uh, uh, natural uh, natural gas. If uh, Shah Deniz project is implemented, and uh, we know that um, after the visit of Prime Minister of Georgia, to Baku, um, as the protocol was signed, um, uh, it will be possible. Um, uh, uh, it will be possible to in, uh, increase the volume of transportation of natural gas at the first stage from eight till sixteen um, billion cubic meters of natural uh, gas, and at the last stage uh, till uh, even thirty billion cubic meters of um, uh, natural uh, gas. And um, uh, if, by this way, uh, uh, to the Tana project um, will be connected um, to the Trans Anatolian. Pipeline project would be connected the top project TAP um, Trans Adriatic uh, pipeline. It will be possible by this way. Um, um, it will be possible. Uh, of course, to uh, transport um, uh, the additional volume of uh, gas uh, in the southern part of Europe, uh, um, uh, bypassing them by the uh, crossing the territories of Georgia and Turkey. In this case, uh, of course, it would um, increase the um, uh, transit potential of Georgia from one side and will uh, bring the additional um, uh, incomes to the budget of Georgia. And from the other side, Turkey can play the role of the energy not only as a transit state but as an energy distributor uh, state and it, of course it will increase uh, the influence of um, uh, Turkey um, uh, in South Caucasus and before, uh, before uh, the uh, European, uh, European Union. Uh, so uh, of course it's uh, at the same time it's important uh, for uh, Georgia to develop uh, cooperation with uh, Armenia despite of uh, differences in the foreign policy uh, priorities uh, between um, the two uh, countries. Uh, our um, good neighborhood relations is uh, uh, going on. We should uh, mention here that from one side uh, about 70 percent of um, uh, the um, uh, export import operation, foreign trade operations uh, uh, which are implemented by Armenia, they are implemented via territory of, uh, uh, via territory of Georgia. Uh, from the uh, other side, uh, of course, um, um, uh, of, um, of course, um, uh, uh, Georgia is interested in this case uh, somehow to, in more integration of the uh, plenipotentiary citizens of Georgia in the Chavaheti region, I mean uh, ethnic Armenians within the Georgian society uh, with the help of uh, um, uh, with the help of Armenia. So by this way, of course, uh, it's an uh, uh, attempt of uh, Georgia to establish um, close relations with all its neighbors, including the Russian Federation. We know that uh, there were some attempts from the uh, Georgian uh, site uh, uh, to uh, renew the uh, export um, uh, towards the Russian uh, Federation within the year of uh, the 2013. Um, um, the volume of export from Georgia to Russia increased for about 70 uh, percent. But um, uh, despite of maybe somehow normalization of the foreign trade relations, unfortunately we know about um, uh, the still um, uh, um, still supporting um, uh, the separate um, by Russia, the official Moscow, the separatist movements in Abkhazia in and uh, uh, former South Ossetia um, um, uh, autonomous region. With regard to the conflict resolution uh, process, what can we uh, say here about the conflict resolution process? Uh, on the territory of Georgia, I think that uh, uh, what are the main perspectives of the resolution of the conflict? First of all, I think uh, that um, uh, those conflicts uh, uh, should be, by this way, resolved um, by, let's say here, Cyprus scenario, that there are different um, uh, scenarios. Yeah? One is maybe Finnish scenario when in 1939 um, Soviets occupied the part of the territory of Finland, but you now after Finland um, 
de facto recognized uh, those occupied territories as a part of uh, uh, USSR, but no uh, prefer to have uh, good relations with neighbor. Um, uh, or Croatian scenario by the result, but uh, it's impossible in case of uh, Georgia because uh, Abkhazia and Srinwali district always um, um, were the historic parts of uh, Georgia, and of course, uh, uh, Georgian side and international community uh, will, uh, will never recognize uh, those uh, uh, territories, but this way, so independent or de facto part of Russia, etc., etc. The second, it may be somehow the Croatia scenario when Croatia managed in 1995 to restore the territorial integrity by military means. Of course, it's impossible at the same time to resolve the problem by military means because, uh, uh, on the matter, in fact, it's uh, not the uh, problem between Tbilisi or Suhumi or Tbilisi and Skinwali, but uh, we have the uh, problem of the interstate conflict between two states, between Russian Federation and uh, Georgia. From the other side, I think that the Geneva talks, yes, uh, uh, the negotiation process also, uh, it um, uh, at this stage cannot bring any positive um, results, uh, taking into consideration that, uh, for example, Russian side requires from Georgia to sign some uh, agreement, um, uh, security agreement uh, between Georgia and Abkhazia, or Georgia South um, um, Ossetia, but it's impossible to sign such kind of agreement because uh, uh, such kind of agreement in the security issues, they are signed between two subjects of international law. In this case, uh, maybe <coughs> necessary to sign uh, this type of agreement <coughs> A security agreement between Russian Federation and uh, and um, uh, and Georgia, and in this case, of course, this agreement will have uh, the uh, validity. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in accordance with um, the principles of um, international law. Uh, otherwise, in my point of view, despite the, um, having the contact with the Russian side or Abkhazian side or Ossetian, Ossetian side by the Georgian, um, from the Georgian side, uh, I think that uh, the process of negotiation uh, will not um, bring any positive uh, result uh, um, until uh, some positions um, um, uh, or uh, coincide between Russia and Georgia or until some compromise, compromises in this case. In, uh, I think it's important, uh, uh, in my point of view, uh, also more involvement of the international democratic community in the resolving of uh, this uh, problem. In my point of view, maybe sanctions somehow also in the long-term perspective will bring uh, some positive results because uh, uh, in my point of view, uh, uh, weakening Russia in this case, yes, okay, we will uh, dig in the, uh, weaken uh, Russia, I think, uh, as the imperialistic ambitions will be uh, decreased, uh, because I would like in this case um, uh, to bring the example of the end of 80s, when um, uh, due to the decreasing the oil prices and uh, due to the um, implement, uh, implementation of the Strategic Defense Initiative program by the Reagan administration of United States of America, increasing the uh, funding of the Afghan Mujahideen, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of 80s, of the 20th century, uh, the budget deficit of USSR increased for about five times. And uh, due to it, later, the uh, Soviet Empire agreed on the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, Central and Eastern Europe, reunification of uh, Germany, etc., etc., etc. In my point of view, now those sanctions also should work when the prices on oil are um, decreasing because we know here. <coughs> When, by this way, that uh, um, uh, this um, interesting uh, ambitions of Russia uh, have been increased. First of all, they were interrelated uh, with the strengthening or economic strengthening of uh, Russia. When, uh, in the beginning of 2000, uh, volume of GDP of Russia was about 200 billion U.S. dollars, but uh, later, because of increasing the prices on oil and increasing the dependence of Europe on Russia, um, um, volume of GDP of Russia prevailed one trillion uh, U.S. dollars. And in, uh, before the war in August, one um, uh, um, <coughs> uh, barrel of oil was cost, as you remember, 147 um, 47 US dollars. Before we know here about the famous um, uh, about the well-known uh, speech of Vladimir Putin in uh, Munich re uh, related to the criticizing the United States of, uh, uh, of America. So, by this way, I, I think that Russia would be more constructive when somehow some economic pressures uh, over the Russia would be implemented, more constructive related to the resolving the problem of Crimea, resolving the problem uh, of Abkhazia, South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh, where Russia uh, tries uh, to play the role of the um, mediator. But from the other side, with regard 
to Georgia, I think that uh, uh, very much is dependent on the Georgian society itself. We should not blame only Russia here because very much is dependent on Georgia. I think that Cyprus scenario uh, would be more acceptable in this case uh, for Georgia if, uh, by this way, um, uh, Georgia is more economically developed and more democratic. Uh, I think that in this case, um, it, will be, uh, it will become more attractive for the inhabitants of Abkhazia and uh, Tsinvali uh, district. Uh, with regard to Cyprus scenario, we know here um, uh, the referendum in 2004, when it was included to the agenda, the entrance of um, unified Cyprus uh, uh, in uh, the European Union, northern part of uh, about 65% of the inhabitants of the northern uh, part of uh, Cyprus, uh, they uh, supported the idea of the reunification of uh, uh, Cyprus. And here, of course, uh, should be welcomed the position of Turkey, which mentioned that if the inhabitants of northern Cyprus, uh, by this way, uh, decide uh, the reunification of uh, Turkey would uh, withdraw its troops from the territory of the northern part of Cyprus. But no, we know that Greek part of uh, Cyprus uh, refused the uh, reunification. But no, anyway, I think that uh, uh, Cyprus scenario is more, by this way, attractive uh, for uh, Georgia for the resolving the uh, problems of Abkhazia and uh, Tsinwali district in uh, long, uh, long term uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, with regard to the problem of Nagorno Karabakh, I um, apologize here before uh, the, my um, the colleagues um, uh, from Armenia and um, Azerbaijan uh, to discuss this issue instead of them because uh, they are more involved um, in the resolving of this uh, problem. Uh, they are more familiar, but in my point of view, with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh, I think that uh, resolving of the problem um, uh, should include um, uh, two parts. First part, uh, I think, uh, related to the territories which surround the territory of uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Nagorno by this way, from one side, uh, withdrawal of Armenian troops from those territories, but the problem is, of course, Lochin Corridor. But from the other, instead, by this way, opening of border between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, between Armenia and Turkey. In this case, of course, uh, uh, it will be decreased the dependence on Armenia, on Russian Federation, as my Turkish colleague, uh, colleague uh, mentioned. And after, uh, to start the discussion related to the status of um, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, so, uh, at the end, um, I would like to, um, by this way, um, um, to mention here about the famous work of a uh, uh, great German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, uh, who uh, mentioned in his uh, uh, book under the name of Perpetual Peace, published in 1795, that uh, uh, one day uh, humanity um, uh, would, uh, would um, uh, get uh, the uh, peace. And uh, let's hope that. Um, uh, um, based on the uh, development of some several peaceful processes in South Caucasus, uh, uh, peace uh, and uh, prosperity uh, one day um, uh, will uh, come in the South Caucasus and White Black Sea area region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stadze. Uh, I think we have a lot of time. Uh, we have 40 minutes but I would like to briefly summarize and draw a picture of these three very valuable presentations here because I think they are very, uh, they complete each other. Uh, first of all, if I may refer, um, first presentation by Dr. Arshamyan, he uh, tried to focus on civil, the role of civil society engagement in the region for future uh, cooperation possibilities, uh, which is, I think, very uh, important. And he mentioned the, eight, uh, the program which has been going on for eight, which will be continuing for 18 months, and uh, which began in 2014, this year. And this is very uh, important, I think. And um, he also focused uh, the importance of prevention of resumption of hostilities and how complicated this is. And after that, I think we all agree, like Dr. Arshamyan, the second track option in future conflict negotiation, uh, conflict resolution processes in the region cannot be uh, considered without the importance of, uh, without considering the importance of a political will on all sides in the region. So I think it is stuck there, 
Uh, and uh, Dr. Arshamyan was mentioning these uh, political importance of these things like the uh, expanding of Eurasian Union and arms race and public radicalization and um, also domestic problems which are also very political. So we cannot disregard the importance of the political uh, uh, will and political development in the region and this will affect uh, positively or negatively the future possibilities for regional cooperation. And uh, maybe we can add that uh, even when the diplomatic and political attempts at reconciliation, they may not necessarily bring up uh, the peace or even the mutual understanding or the dialogue that we are seeking. Uh, that there might be some structural problems or third party related things, third party related problems, uh, which I will be mentioning. First of all, we have uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh the, the example of Minsk Group co-chair system, which is very problematic even today for the, for the co-chairs themselves and the, uh, both parties which are involved in the uh, conflict itself. We have to mention this. And also Russia's involvement is a very important factor and, uh, and also Russia's competitive relation with the West also has to be mentioned here uh, for the control of the closed neighborhood and all these geopolitically important places in, in this region. And even then, we cannot still limit the problem to uh, the superpower zero-sum game here. And there are other uh, problems which uh, uh, these problems were all mentioned by Dr. Palabik uh, when, we, uh, we, when we were talking about the Turkish-Armenian relations and the increasing importance of the international politics and their influence on the regional conciliation, reconciliation efforts, uh, like 9-11 events and uh, Russia's return and Caspian Basin's uh, importance, increasing importance, and the importance of the uh, resources there. I think they are very important. And uh, also Dr. Palabuik's presentation, uh, I think, emphasized the uh, domestic structural points all, uh, and it is very important. And Dr. Chitadze's um, presentation uh, brings up another dimension, which is a uh, more international dynamic, uh, geopolitics of the South Caucasus. And uh, this, is, uh, this importance is still rising as the sh uh, balance of international politics, as uh, our honorary president's uh, speech has also ho already mentioned. The importance of the polit international politics is shifting through the East, uh, one pillar of which is South Caucasus, and it is very fragile. So uh, we have to consider the possibility of the expanding of the conflicts and the instability in the Caucasus, and Dr. Chitatsi's uh, presentation also put it in very well uh, terms that all these are interconnected issues in the region. But still, I think there is something missing, uh, which is uh, the view by uh, the Azerbaijani, uh, Azerbaijani political view is missing in our uh, session, I think. We have to mention some important parameters by the Azerbaijan's uh, foreign policy, if I may. Um, uh, there are so, a number of principles we have to consider when we talk about Azerbaijan's foreign policy as guidelines in the region. One of them is the need to transform possible threats in the region into strategic partnerships and opportunities, which may, we may apply to any other nation state in the world, but uh, in a very fragile region like South Caucasus, this is, I think, one of the most important things to mention. And secondly, uh, Azerbaijan has to protect the image of Azerbaijan as a responsible partner in all its international relations. 
And thirdly, uh, Azerbaijan also has to build a strong and competitive economy that will enable the country to be independent in decisions regarding its resource management, which is also very important for future possible conciliation efforts and also the secure economic stability trade in the region. And fourthly, uh, maintaining a secure corridor between Europe and Asia for the free flow of trade, people, energy, resources, technology, and communications. So all these four guidelines, uh, they emphasize transformation, protection and promotion, integration with the world economy, and securing resources and trade. When we consider it like this, this picture, uh, we, we can say that, therefore, despite the rising economic and political power the country possesses, Azerbaijan possesses, uh, she also carefully considers her national interests here, which clearly represents a good example of pragmatic foreign policy. So I think what brings us, uh, what br uh, this brings us to another point, which is, uh, this future itself, this pragmatic foreign policy itself, makes it uh, available for us. It, it enables us to speak about the future of cooperation because we can still talk. Uh, as Dr. Arshamyan said, no war but no peace. It is, uh, it's not frozen, but we are not going back. We are not going for, uh, we are not going forward. So it is in the middle, but still it's, it itself shows that this pragmatic choice of foreign policy on the part of Azerbaijan enables us to speak about it, to speak about uh, future cooperation. But still, cooperation will not come without effort from all sides, and only a mutual awareness that future cooperation is for the benefit of all sides, and only then we will be able to listen to one another and now uh, we are ready to listen to you if you have any questions. I hope I was uh, very delicate uh, about the presentations. I will just, I just try to draw a picture. You can add or you can just correct me if I'm wrong. And we are now open to questions. We have 30 minutes. Any questions? Yes, uh, sorry, Ambassador. Uh, first, Ambassador here, please. And then another gentleman here, and then, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Actually, the speakers deserve credit for their excellent presentations. And they were not only excellent, but they were also very neutral and impartial. Uh, uh, I, I believe that all the audience join me uh, to congratulate, congratulate them for their presentations. Actually, uh, no conflict, no friction happens without the contribution. That means, uh, that is to say, without the errors committed by the both parties. Maybe the error committed by one party is less than the other, but Without the contribution of both parties, no conflict and friction hap uh, uh, happens. And uh, Mr. Dr. Arshamian um, uh, uh, mentioned uh, 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 about the Karabakh, Dağlı Karabakh question. Actually, uh, I saw uh, two or three persons mention Nagorno Karabakh. Actually, it is official uh, uh, name that area in histori historical books is Dağlık Karabağ and nobody is entitled to change the official names. My official, my name is Muzaffer. It means victorious, but nobody is entitled to, to call me victorious. It is uh, uh, Karabağ uh, and then Dağlık, uh, Dağlık Karabağ. And uh, actually, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Arshamyan mentioned uh, about uh, the uh, the solution, uh, uh, solution of the conflict problems between Armenia and Turkey it is his main uh, field as, uh, as well. As uh, it is understood, it is to a very large extent dependable 
on the solution of the Dalek Karabakh conflict. And uh, I would like to ask him, uh, of course, for the solution of this, uh, Track 2 activities are very, very important. And then today is a remarkable Track 2 activity. Again, uh, the organizers, they uh, uh, deserve credit uh, uh, for their organization. What concessions the both parties from the, uh, from the Azerbaijan and Armenian side could be made according to your opinion regarding the solution of the Dalek Karabakh problem? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if I may interrupt. Uh, I will just uh, draw all the questions and then leave the floor to you if, if that's suitable for you. Please, gentlemen here. And then thirdly, sir, there. Thank yes, you. Cengiz uh, Dinç from Eskişehir Osman Gazi University. Actually, I have uh, three short questions. Uh, one um, to especially to Dr. Arshamian. Uh, how can we explain the uh, influence of diaspora uh, on the issue? Actually, there are conflicting views that some say is that Armenian uh, public opinion is directing diaspora and others argue that actually diaspora is driving the, uh, Armenia to the uh, non-solution. <coughs> the actually, the uh, second question is more anybody who can, uh, who like to answer it, but uh, again, more towards to Dr. Arshamian. How can we explain the fact that after a Second World War uh, ended 1945 uh, and left uh, almost 60 million deaths uh, just after one or two decades after Second World War, we see uh, Germany and France uh, participating in creation of European communities. Uh, and then, <coughs> even after 100 years, we cannot solve problems between Armenia and Turkey. I myself, uh, I myself, uh, I myself try to explain this with a lack of modernization, because uh, when we learn that modern people, modern person, uh, try to look forward and not try to look backwards all the time. And we see Germans and uh, France, they choose the modern way and looking towards the future and uh, try to build a, a prosperous, a peaceful future. But uh, we, the Turks and Armenians, I assume, uh, we couldn't modernize enough, and this includes lack of democratization, lack of industrial base, lack of civil society. So if it is the case, uh, we might need another 40 to 50 years uh, to wait uh, um, emergence of fully modern uh, democracy. The last question shortly towards Dr. Uh, Chatzatze, sorry for <laughs> my pronunciation. How can we explain the exceptionality of Georgia in the Caucasus in terms of uh, um, lack of uh, or uh, not depending on Russia? We see, for example, Armenia and Azerbaijan, they have a dependent relation uh, with Russia as far as we can see. They all uh, try to take the cue from Russia. But Georgia and also Chechnya, for example, they didn't follow the Russian lead. They tried to oppose uh, Russia, especially Georgia tried to join NATO. How can we explain this exceptionality? Can we explain it through just history? Or if you can enlighten us, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please, Ambassador, here. And then, just, just, yeah. And then you, sir. Oh, a new one, huh? Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, this is Zhang from the Taiwan mission in Ankara. And uh, I would follow the professor's uh, questions uh, he mentioned uh, just uh, uh, before. Um, about the Crimean crisis. Actually, 
um, if we look at back around the March 28 this year, when the Putin just put a uh, decree in the midnight to uh, start a one uh, military drill on the Black Sea uh, military level, naval base on that midnight. And uh, nominally, Putin just the same, uh, according to the news report, is saying uh, just because Putin would reconsider and uh, restrain the military power for Russian army just because of the uh, failure during Russia's uh, uh, conflict with uh, Georgia in 2008 uh, just because the uh, uh, Russian uh, army is not so good as that time, according to uh, similar like this uh, report. So then uh, three months ago, the Crimea crisis happened. I think uh, this is uh, quite uh, a free association about uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, cover, covered action for the Putin, probably. But uh, my question is uh, how the South Caucasus countries, including Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey as well, to look at uh, this criminal crisis for the regional security for the future, especially uh, there's a sound uh, uh, trend. It's like uh, the Black Sea security will be affected by this uh, crisis as well. Then the second question is, uh, uh, in this uh, region, I, I mean in South uh, Caucasus uh, region, then there's uh, some big powers, uh, including Russia, like uh, uh, Dr. Chetadji mentioned about this, Russia, EU, and uh, some other key regional players like uh, US or uh, Turkey, Iran. Then what do you think? Uh, first key player will be the uh, big, biggest influence on this uh, process for the South Caucasus uh, development and uh, for the uh, regional security uh, for the future. Yeah, this is uh, my two questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. And Ambassador, please, here. Thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers for their very valuable contributions. I was uh, very much impressed by Professor Dr. Uh, Palabik's comprehensive um, description of the situation and especially the to-do list that he uh, presented at the end. And uh, Im uh, most importantly, I thought that the lack of confidence element uh, at the end is a very important point but I don't want to take too much of your time. I would like to just address one question at Dr. Uh, Arshamyan, um, and this relates a little bit to uh, Dr. Palabik's presentation. Um, of all the uh, questions that exist between Turkey and Armenia and also Azerbaijan, uh, there are many points of disagreement, of course, and uh, to address them, one has to go step by step. The incremental approach that Dr. Palabik mentioned, the point that I wonder is, do you see any ground for agreement to disagree uh, as, a, as a first step, to agree to disagree on the fundamental points and thereby uh, be able to uh, approach the peripheral questions that an agreement can be reached upon. I hope I uh, was able to explain my question. Um, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
first gentleman here and then you. My name is Erhan Canikoğlu from uh, Institute of Turkey in the 21st century. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this, the meeting. Um, I want to ask to Mr. Palabuyuk that uh, if I am not mistaken, at the end of his speech, he suggested that the problems in the Caucasia should be regionalized. Before coming to the meeting, I checked the strategies, policy, recommendations, and some national security blueprints of the United States, Russia, and the European Union. But I noticed that there are all conflicting interests in the region. Do you really believe that the problems in the region can be solved through regional efforts and only by the regional countries? Thank you very much. Thank you. And here, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Muzaffarpur from Iran Embassy in Ankara. Uh, my, uh, I, I have just a short c comment about Dr. Nika's uh, speech uh, statements, you know, because uh, uh, when I call Dr. Nika, it, it is a little bit hard. Do Dr. Nika Chitzat, right? Okay, it, it first. Uh, but it, 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 he mentioned about Iran, he talked about Iran's role in, in security dimension and economic dimension in uh, Caucasus. Uh, let me mention that I wish we had a representative from the Islamic Republic of Iran here to, to drop the Iranian position. And, uh, but the this, is a, the, this is a notice and uh, the question regards to uh, uh, the, the energy issue that you mentioned again. Uh, because, uh, for example, uh, we have a great dynamism about energy in the region. Uh, President Putin came here, he discussed energy issue, it, it was very hot issue. And uh, of course, it was, he, he was uh, going to make an alternative for EU pipeline or Ukraine pipeline. President, Honorable President Erdogan went to Turkmenistan 40 days ago, he discussed the pipeline issue as well and he discussed it, you know, to make a pipeline uh, to transport energy from Turkmenistan and then making a, a connection with Azerbaijan gas you know, resources and then transporting it to, to, to Western world. And in, Cent in Caucasus also we have a dynamism as you mentioned. So what will eventually happen to the region? Which, because you talked, you said that it is unfortunate. It obeys the logic of zero-sum game, and when it's zero-sum game, always you know superpowers are doing so and obeying this logic. Do you think that in future we will have a good, stable region without superpowers? Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I will leave the floor to speakers. Uh, please. Dr. Ashamian. So I will try to be very brief because we have only 20 minutes, right? Yeah, we have 20. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, about the solution of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the question about that. In my paper, I just uh, concentrated on that and suggested around like 10 activities which will enable the parties and the international uh, community and the mediators of the conflict to try to resolve that conflict. And uh, for the second question about the diaspora and Nagorno-Karabakh uh, relations, in, uh, in Armenia and diaspora, diaspora is mostly concentrated on genocide issue. Uh, and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh issue is uh, like more popular in Armenia because diaspora Armenians, uh, uh, they know that they have, their ancestors were from uh, eastern part of Turkey and they have that, uh, uh, how to say that, uh, memory. But uh, for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, diaspora is not so connected and related. So I don't see 
and importance of involvement of diaspora in this issue. And uh, as of the solving our relations with Turkey and why we can't solve that and why we should maybe we should wait for uh, 40, 50 years. And maybe I'll connect that question with uh, to agree with a disagreement. Uh, in my point of view, we have only one disagreement, big disagreement with Turkey, which is the genocide issue. And uh, well, we think that first of all, it sh we should, uh, Turkey should open the borders and Armenia, the like, Turkey-Armenian border should be opened uh, and, and normalize the relations and start the diplomatic relations. And later on, uh, the reconciliation uh, will come into the ground. Because uh, starting, and you are right, starting from the past, uh, starting normalization from the past, it's maybe wrong. We should uh, start immediately the normalization from the uh, opening of the borders and uh, establishing diplomatic relations. And later on, we'll see what we can do together. Um, what else? Uh, lack of modernization on both sides, does it affect uh, Turkish-Armenian reconciliation? One of the questions was. Like, uh, what kind of modernization? If uh, I'm in uh, Armenia-Turkey normalization process from the civil society for more than four years, and I was, before, uh, being in the program that I mentioned, that normalization of our military relations, uh, I was uh, a coordinator, program coordinator for the support to Armenia Turkey rapprochement uh, supported by USAID, which was uh, a continuation or a track to uh, diplomacy development immediately after the protocols were signed. And uh, my experience showed that we have lots of young people, especially young people in Armenia and in Turkey, uh, who are for normalization, who are for reconciliation. Uh, it's just, uh, the contradiction is uh, mostly between the governments and between the states. But the people who are living in our countries uh, are mostly for normalization of the relations between two, neighbors. Thank you. Uh, I think this question also applies to other speakers. If they want to answer, uh, do you consider it relevant, the lack of modernization on both sides on, in all of these countries in the region, and maybe uh, concessions that must be given from the parties when we are considering the future of this reconciliation and cooperation in the region? Uh, if you call it a concession, uh, I think. And Dr. Palabi, would you please? Uh, well, thank you very much for these uh, thought-provoking questions, first of all. Uh, three questions uh, may be addressed by myself. The first is a direct question. Uh, can the uh, uh, problems between uh, Turkey or the solutions between Turkey uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan can be regionalized. Uh, I think yes, they can be regionalized, uh, but uh, regionalization does not necessarily mean exclusion of global actors. Of course, they have to be incorporated. Uh, and protocols indeed is an example of how global powers have a mediating uh, effect uh, in bilateral relations. Uh, these protocols were prepared with the mediation of the United States, European Union. Uh, Russia may be, uh, did not support them full heartedly uh, because of the risk of uh, you know, decreasing dependence of Armenia to Russia, but it did not object them either. Uh, therefore, regionalization of problems is for uh, building up mutual confidence. Uh, because these problems were very much interlinked with each other. Uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Arshamyan says uh, a minute before, 
uh, first uh, diplomatic recognition and border opening and then other issues. But indeed, all these issues are very much interlinked. Turkey did not, uh, 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 did not establish diplomatic relations with Armenia because of, solely because of genocide issue. As I mentioned, we have the, at least in the Turkish uh, foreign policy making, the problem of non-recognition of uh, territorial integrity of Turkey. And the borders, borders are not closed because of genocide issue. Borders are closed because of Karabakh issue. Therefore, when, for instance, uh, there is a clear recognition of uh, borders with the re clear recognition of the Treaty of Kars, most probably this would be a step for establishment of uh, bilateral diplomatic relations. When Karabakh question was resolved, or at least significant steps were taken, sound steps were taken for resolution, most probably there would be a, a very significant advance in the border opening. Uh, therefore, these questions, uh, these interregional questions were very much interlinked and their solutions were very much interlinked. What I mean by regionalization is exactly this. Uh, without solution, without total solution of these problems, uh, the, the uh, reconciliation process would be uh, problematic, I think. Uh, secondly, uh, the the uh, Crimean crisis and the uh, perception of uh, regional countries on this issue. Uh, I can say that, uh, of course, Turkey was very much concerned about the uh, Russian intervention uh, in Crimea and in Ukraine later. Uh, it is very important for Black Sea security and as the initiator of the Black Sea uh, Economic Cooperation Organization, and a very active actor in the Black Sea, Turkey was very much concerned about the security of the Black Sea region. But uh, Turkish policy was something like a wait and see policy, until now at least. Uh, although Turkey has significant concerns, Turkey still tries to see what would happen next. Uh, because, you know, Turkish orientation, although there were some setbacks, uh, is generally in line with American and European uh, policies in the region. Recently, there are talks with Russia. Putin's visit to Turkey was a very significant event, but still there were significant disagreements between Turkey and Russia on various issues. Uh, so Turkey uh, holds, uh, Turkey waits to see what will happen next, particularly in the Ukrainian crisis. So Turkey's policy is a bit a policy of silence, in a sense. And finally, uh, the issue of lack of modernization, whether uh, Turkey, uh, lack of modernization in Turkey and Armenia resulted in the discussion of past events. Uh, I just underlined two points. Uh, the German-France experience is very different from uh, Turkish-Armenian experience because uh, only in 20 years Turkey and Fr uh, Germany and France had uh, something like a peace and something like a cooperation. But uh, we have the Cold War uh, and, you know, Armenia turned out to be a Soviet republic and the issue uh, between Turkey and Armenia became an issue of Turkey and Soviet Union, indeed. Uh, that's why uh, the solution was very much delayed. Uh, secondly, uh, Turkey uh, did not much interested in the Armenian question uh, until, let's say, 1980s. Turkey uh, uh, was on the process of internal modernization at that time, focused its attention not on external problems, but on internal issues to a great extent. Uh, and therefore, not only until, um, you know, Asala uh, activities, particularly Turkey, recognized that there is something like an Armenian question. The publications is a very good indication. Only after these incidents, Turkey began to publish, Turkey began to study the, but, that there is a problem called Armenian question. That's why we are so late uh, on this issue. Therefore, uh, the Germany-France experience is very different uh, and making such analogies uh, may uh, make us fail to understand uh, the difficulties between Turkey and Armenia. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you for the questions. With your permission, I would like, I will try to answer all questions and make comment related to uh, Georgia Russia uh, relations. Uh, after the um, uh, restoration of the in, uh, independence of Georgia as a result of disintegration of uh, USSR, uh, all governments in Georgia tried, of course, to establish normal relations with Russia. <coughs> It's usual, of course, uh, uh, to have uh, normal relations with the country, area of the territory of which prevails uh, territory of Georgia for 253 times. Of course, it's uh, normal to have good relations with this uh, country. But uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Russia encouraged uh, the uh, conflicts in the Tsinwali district and in Abkhazia in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, and uh, the, uh, by the implementation of so-called indirect aggression against Georgia. Yes, okay. I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, training of uh, the terrorist groups in Northern Caucasus and sending them in Abkhazia. We know that uh, it's uh, uh, indirect aggression because uh, uh, General Assembly of UN in 1974 adopted the resolution related to determination of aggression. There are two types of aggression. Indirect, when one country prepares to, uh, supports uh, some separatist movement, yes, okay, funds some uh, uh, groups, illegal armed formations. Uh, uh, and so it was indirect aggression in the beginning of 90s, and in August 2008, Russia implemented the direct aggression when uh, Russian troops invaded on the ter territory of Georgia by the occupation to historic parts of uh, Georgia. So uh, in the beginning of 90s, Russia implemented the pressure of Georgia related to the deployment of so-called peacekeepers, Russian peacekeepers on the territory of Georgia, but Georgia agreed uh, on the deployment of four military bases of Russia uh, on the territory of Georgia instead of the promotion of the restoration of territorial integrity of Georgia in 1994 to sign the agreement. But uh, Russia State Duma refused to uh, um, uh, ratify this agreement, I mean, uh, bilateral agreement between uh, Georgia and uh, um, Russia Federation. Later, uh, as we know, that Russia introduced uh, as, um, uh, visa regime with Georgia, but not, um, uh, not Georgia, by this way. And Russia has violated for several times uh, airspace of um, uh, Georgia um, uh, during the conflict in Chechnya. It was before uh, the Rose Revolution, because later we know that it in 2008, when Russia implemented a attack against Georgia, uh, they mentioned that Russia was fighting against the Saakashvili regime. But on the matter, in fact, they were fighting against the Georgian statehood. Before, for them, was not acceptable Eduard Shevardnadze, former president of Georgia, after Mikhail Saakashvili, today the current government, with regard to Rose Revolution, for example, yes, uh, so uh, first visit, which was implemented by the new elected president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, was held uh, neither in Brussels nor in Washington, but in Moscow, okay? So, and uh, uh, Georgia tried by this way, of course, uh, establish those normal relations. During his inauguration speech, Mikhail Saakashvili mentioned uh, only about Russia. He mentioned that uh, about the readiness to shake the hand of uh, Russia, and say, and say, unfortunately, uh, we know that uh, Russia introduced the sanctions against Georgia, economic sanctions in 2006, but those sanctions did not work. Why? Because um, on the contrary, the next year, uh, GDP of Georgia increased for about 11 percent. After Georgia managed, by the way, to decrease the energy dependence of Russia after the, um, starting the exploit exploitation of the Bakut Pilisi Shah Denis uh, uh, gas pipeline. Yes, okay, so and uh, it caused uh, anger from Russian side. They were continuing by this way to pressure over the Georgia. One uh, month before the war in August of 2008, um, when Saakashvili and Medvedev met with each other, uh, Mr. Saakashvili applied to Medvedev and said that uh, those those tensions, we had, uh, uh, we had not uh, those tensions between two countries before. Not, uh, you are mistaken, uh, Mr. Saakashvili. Uh, the worst tensions will be held very soon. And after we know about the aggression of Russia against uh, Georgia. And even today, and, uh, under a new government, uh, under the new government, government of Georgian dream, when, by this way, uh, it was created its uh, format, Abashidze Karasin, I mean, uh, representative for Prime Minister Abashidze and uh, Deputy uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Russia, um, 
um, uh, Karasin. They have met for uh, several times, and uh, uh, by this way, Georgia expressed the readiness to reestablish uh, trade relations with Russia, but uh, on the contrary, we know that uh, Russia moved the occupation line uh, in the Tsinwali district, for example, uh, and uh, we know here about the signing of so-called agreement between Russia and uh, Abkhazia about integration, etc. Of course, this so-called agreement contradicts with the principles of international law, but anyway, so what should uh, the small country do by this way? And of course, with regard to NATO and European Union, the usual moment, and each country, of course, in the world, and there are 193 plenipotentiary members of United Nations, each country, according to the principle of the sovereign equality of each country, according to principle of law, they have its um, right for um, uh, to choose a partner, ally, and it's uh, for implementation its own foreign policy priorities. And of course, uh, for, uh, for Georgia, it's more preferable to establish closer relations with uh, uh, United States of America, with European Union. Of course, uh, uh, very important, uh, we pay attention on the relations with neighbors, I mean uh, about the brotherhood relations with Armenia, with Azerbaijan and with Turkey. Yes, um, 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 so, but uh, we prefer of course to have a strong ally like NATO, like the uh, European Union for the strengthening our, uh, our sovereignty because of course America has its own interest in South Caucasus. Of course, um, European Union, yes, of course, Big players, yes, Turkey, yes, it's, it's usual, yes, but uh, what, uh, what are our cho choice? Of course, to have good relations with those countries which respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Georgia and not with those countries which violate uh, uh, the principles of international law by the occupation to historic parts, um, uh, parts of uh, Georgia. With regard to the Crimea case, in my point of view, I think that it's an important case. I think that, uh, of course, um, it's necessary there's a more involvement in the, in, of the international community in the resolving of this problem. First of all, Turkey should play a very important role, taking into consideration that about 15% of the population in Crimea, there are Crimean Tatars. And they are basic population today uh, because uh, after the occupation of Crimea by Russia as a result of the uh, Turkish-Russia war uh, at the second half of 18th, particularly in 18, uh, 1784, this territory, uh, Ekaterina the Great occupied this territory, Crimea, okay, and after it was going on, the settlement of the Russian population there. Okay? It's also somehow the changing of the demographic situation. And today, about 60% they are ethnic Russians, and they yeah, voted uh, for the integration with Russia during uh, so-called referendum, which has no uh, legal validity, but not the fact of this referendum uh, was held. I, I think uh, Turkey and, uh, of course, international democratic community, which works, for example, related to the sanctions towards Russia, uh, because Russia should be more progressive related to the resolving the Crimea problem, and Etc. Et and uh, we, uh, one of the examples, when uh, previous Ukrainian government, Yanukovych government, which was considered pro-Russia, they did some steps related to uh, prolongation the deployment of the Russian military base in Sevastopol from 2017 uh, till 2043. But what results do we uh, have now? Uh, now we have the results that Russia controls the uh, Crimea uh, Peninsula, and um, so unfortunately. And uh, by this way, it has the uh, second biggest military base. Okay, one of them is located in Ochamchire, on the occupied territory of Georgia, particularly in Abkhazian Autonomous uh, Republic. And by this way, of course, Russia would like to increase its uh, um, uh, influence, okay, in the Black Sea, uh, Black sea region, because uh, uh, <coughs> Russia was always considering the Black Sea region the zone of strategic interest. We know about the Crimea War. We know about uh, the war in 1877-78 between uh, Ottoman Empire and uh, R Russian Empire, so went, uh, um, due to it, Russia would like to increase its uh, interest, but uh, with regard to who, who should be the key player in South, South Caucasus, in my point of view, the key player uh, should be, um, key, uh, key players, uh, I think, uh, should, um, uh, key sh I mean, EU and the United States of America should be key players. I mean, those um, um, organization or country which respect uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of uh, three South Caucasus, um, uh, South Caucasus 
Socialist uh, Republics, yes, in my point of view. I think that uh, more integration uh, of uh, the region to the Western democratic community uh, with, uh, will create a convenient base uh, for the strengthening independence of uh, okay, all three uh, states by this way. Uh, so with regard to Iranian factor, of course, Iran um, should play a very important uh, role. And uh, uh, me person I personally welcome, of course, more involvement of uh, Iran in the energy projects, taking into consideration that Iran, uh, on the share of Iran, uh, uh, comes about 9% of the world oil reserves and about 16% uh, of the world gas reserves. And uh, uh, in this regard, in my point of view, I think uh, that uh, uh, for Western countries should be one of the priority to uh, establish normal relations with Iran. Okay, and uh, uh, it's very, very, very important because we see here the coincidence, coincidence of the interests of USA and Iran, what I mean. I mean so-called Islamic states. Of course, it's so-called, why? Because it uh, has no common with, neither with Islam nor, nor with the state, of course, yes? But uh, anyway, uh, this, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, this representatives of illegal armed formations, terrorists control the biggest part of the territory of Iraq. It, uh, it contradicts with the interests of Iran. It contradicts with the interests of the West. In my point of view, uh, cooperation is necessary in this case. As with regard to the nuclear program of uh, Iran, um, it's also, I think, Iran has right, of course, to develop its nuclear program. But if it's more transparent, Iran can offer to the West uh, to increase export of oil and gas, is, uh, uh, especially when uh, Western countries are interested in the decreasing the energy dependence on uh, um, Russia, we know here, yes, okay? And we know here that the competitor of uh, Iran can be United States of America, which considers the issue of the export the shell gas on the territory of European Union, yes, I mean, uh, what here is that uh, we know uh, that uh, uh, in the 2013, America produced more natural gas than Russia. And uh, by this way, I think that uh, Iran should hurry, hurry up and uh, somehow to uh, have the, um, um, I think, to conduct the negotiation with the uh, West related to um, uh, maybe increase uh, the um, uh, gas and uh, oil export uh, on the European market. And it's, of course, acceptable in my point of view uh, we, uh, for the countries of South so the Caucasus system, even for Azerbaijan, despite the fact we can co consider here the competitor relations between uh, Iran and Azerbaijan. Georgia itself is very much interested uh, uh, in uh, the uh, strengthening of uh, Iran, and we know that despite the fact that Georgia intends to become the member of NATO, has a pro-American orientation, anyway, in 2006, uh, uh, within the General Assembly of United Nations, Mr. Saakashvili met uh, with uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad, uh, and we know that one period Iran exported uh, natural gas on the Georgian market and uh, several years ago uh, Georgia and Iran introduced a non-visa regime with each other and in my point of view I think uh, that uh, uh, Iran can play a positive uh, role, uh, positive in favor of Iran itself and in favor of uh, uh, South Caucasus and in favor of uh, Europe in my point of view because during the last period uh, we see some uh, coincidences of the, in the interest of uh, uh, Western countries with uh, Islamic Republic public of uh, uh, Iran. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chitatsi. Uh, I think this is the end of our session here, and we are on time, on schedule. Thank you for listening, and we have lunch now. Okay, thank you.